Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, we interview inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. This episode is a recorded conversation between myself, co host Joe Stewart, and Cara Leah Grant. Cara Leah Grant is probably one of New Zealand's most well known yoga teachers. As well as being a phenomenal teacher and guide, she's the creator and prolific contributor to New Zealand's most popular yoga website, The Yoga Lunchbox. She's also the author of two books, 40 Days of Yoga and The No Excuses Guide to Yoga. In this conversation, we talk about writing, how yoga is a practice for waking up and what that even means. We talk about her process in delivering transformational retreat experiences and how she takes care of herself during that time. We'll also explore the subject of her upcoming book, Kundalini Awakening. We were really keen to talk to Karalia about this as we know several people personally who've gone through this type of intense experience. It's a great conversation, but before we get started, Joe has an exciting message to share with you. Hey, it's Joe here, and I'm really excited about an upcoming Hoop Sparks retreat. Hoop away on July 20th to 22nd. It's a winter hoop retreat in Hillsville, Victoria, Australia, with vegan and veggie food, hooping workshops with Donna Sparks and Heli Hoops, meditation, Pilates, yoga, and self myofascia release workshops with me. We've done podcast episodes with Donna and Heli, and they're both awesome and inspiring hoop teachers, performers, and people. So I'm really excited to be presenting this retreat with them. We've linked to pricing and details, including early bird specials and payment plans in the show notes below. Next up, our talk with Caralia Grant. So we're wondering if you could just perhaps start by telling us a little bit about your background and where you grew up. Uh, So I'm a Kiwi and I grew up mostly in Dunedin, down in the South Island. I studied journalism at tertiary level. And that was sort of media, communications, writing. That was always one of my passions. And then went traveling, just went overseas and kind of traveled and partied for about eight years, which is when I fully got into yoga, sort of at the tail end of that experience. That's sort of a really brief synopsis of my background. No, that definitely leads us into today. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your very first yoga class? Uh Uh, My first class was in 1995 on the North Shore of Auckland. And my boyfriend at the time, his friend, his male friend actually was teaching yoga, which was like, you know, unheard of back in the mid nineties in New Zealand. And so we signed up for a 10 week course and it was Iyengar yoga. And I just remember like I was, I must've been 19 or 20 and I'd had a back operation, a spinal fusion when I was 16 and my, I had no flexibility. Like I couldn't even reach my knees, let alone my toes. And so I just remember like in Iyengar, there would take there was two teachers in the class and it would sometimes take both of them to get me propped up enough into whatever we were doing so that I could be in the posture. And it sometimes felt like by the time they got me propped into the posture, it was time to go on to the next one. Yeah. And so even kind of having those challenges, did you still kind of feel like you you benefited from that practice? Like you didn't feel self conscious or frustrated when, you know, your experience was obviously quite different to the rest of the class? No, I don't remember it bothering me per se. I do remember, like, there was a woman who was teaching and my my friend's friend. I do remember looking at her and thinking, like, she was, you know, quite young. And then I found out later she was in her mid-40s. And I was like, oh, my (laughs) Because compared to all the other, like, old people I knew then, she just seemed so youthful. So that stood out. And the other thing that stood out was I just knew that yoga was going to be a massive part of my life. It was just like, Something in it was familiar. It's like I knew it. I'd been there before or something. I'm not quite sure. But it was just this knowing that yoga and I were going to have a a very long relationship. Oh, beautiful. Just like that meant to be feeling. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And so what was your inspiration for starting the Yoga Lunchbox website? I had just done a four-day or three-day module. It was Labor Weekend here in New Zealand in 2008. And I'd done a three or four day module with Twee Merrigan, who's one of Shiva Ray's master teachers for Prana Flow. I've been to a couple of their workshops, yeah. Oh, yeah, and she's amazing. And it was, it was actually, I've been teaching at that stage for about two years, but I'd done no training. And that was my first ever teacher training module. Ah. I came out of it like, oh my God, so inspired and so excited. And I just had this real 
clarity of like, I got to play my part to bring yoga to the people. Ah, so yes. That was the original mission. Like, cause back in 2008 yoga, and especially in New Zealand, it wasn't like it is now. And so I was like, yeah, let's bring yoga to the people. And so the yoga lunchbox was born and initially as Prana Flow NZ. And then I realized that it wasn't just about one style. And so I rebranded um, about a year or so later to the Yoga Lunchbox. Beautiful. I actually really love the line in your uh, No More Excuses Guide to Yoga. Uh, I'll lead you by the hand into your first yoga class so you can feel comfortable, keep yourself safe and understand the many strange things that are part of yoga. So it mm. seems like that thread of kind of guiding people into this world of yoga and supporting them has always been kind of part of your mission and part of your practice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd always bump into people who would say to me, oh, I'd, I'd love to try yoga or, oh, I've been meaning to try yoga or I would, I really want to go to yoga, but I can't because I'm this or I'm that, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, there's all these people out there who would benefit so massively, but there's this huge block preventing them from, that you know desire to go and actually getting through the the first you know class so that inspired me to write the no more excuses guide to yoga because i wanted to be that friend that person that guide that could help them get over the uncomfortable feelings and get over the unknown and, and get over all of that trepidation and and get into the first class that's so lovely where do you think the kind of fear and the trepidation comes from in people that's kind of holding them back I suspect that the visual image that yoga has is a big part of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> especially, you know, in the last five to, you know, 10 years, we are bombarded with images of what people think yoga is. Yeah. And we compare ourselves and it's like, you know, if, if we're an older person or a larger person or we're not white and middle class, you look at all the images and you're like, well, that's not me or I couldn't do that. And I do think, as yoga teachers and yoga studios, we have a real responsibility to be mindful of the kind of um, images we put out there of yoga, like to, to actually make a concerted effort to be more inclusive in our media stuff, you know? Yeah, I love the sequence of articles that you've actually shared on the Yoga Lunchbox recently, the whole yoga is to everybody, series, mm. kind of looking to different backgrounds, different cultures different sizes to kind of share that experience and just kind of welcome people in and let them know how yoga is for everybody it's a really like beautiful positive contribution to that discourse mm. yeah i really wanted to add to that because there's, there's some amazing work that's being done out there in that sphere of diversity and inclusivity and to just um, bring in some of those people that are doing that work um, was you know it was really awesome and, and allow them to, you know, give them a platform to speak. Not that they need it, because they've often got big enough platforms of their own. Um, but like Jessamine, Jessamine, is that how you pronounce her name? Jessamine Stanley? That's how I say it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she is amazing. An amazing woman doing amazing things, you know? And it's just like, hell yeah, we, that's what we need is more of that. And I know like in New Zealand, yoga is still very much, a, you know, a white middle class pursuit. And my sense too is that walking into a yoga studio is really intimidating. It's so intimidating. If it's not your world, it's intimidating. Even if it is kind of your world, going to a new studio when you know no one there, you know, and you don't know what to expect. It's intimidating even if you've been going to yoga for a couple of years. So what I love is the people that are actually taking yoga out to different diverse populations like yoga education and prisons trust. They, you know, obviously they go into prisons to take yoga to people who are incarcerated right now and then when those people come out of prison they're far more likely to possibly go and find a yoga studio because they've already got a level of comfort with the practice itself and also just a level of mental health leaving prison that they might not have had if they hadn't had these practices to go to in like that super stressful environment it's like if the goal of prison is rehabilitation it's like important that people actually get that chance to connect to themselves and to a sense of inner peace. Yeah, it's like a no-brainer, you know. And, and yeah, the, yeah, totally. <laughs> like the stats, back out into the world. <laughs> you know, and the stats and the stories and the anecdotes and stuff that come in from my friends who teach in prisons and the impact it has on their students is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. So, 
Um, self-realization is obviously a key theme in your writing and in your life as well. Mm. And something that you kind of gently introduce in the No More Excuses Guide to Yoga. Would you like to kind of share like your thoughts around self-realization and the different forms that it can take? I can only share from my experience. So I only know from, you know, what I have experienced per se. Like it's not like I'm an expert, you know, on the matter. What I've noticed is that, you know, as a teenager in my 20s, I was really unconscious. And I suspect that a lot of people are. It's like we don't actually know why we're doing what we're doing, why we're thinking the thoughts we're thinking, why we're not even aware quite often of what we're thinking. Um, like things like self-hatred and guilt and shame, all of those emotions and thoughts, et cetera, they, they almost live below the surface of consciousness. I mean, scientifically too, when we look at our mind, they reckon, those scientists, that about 85% of the mind, et cetera, is unconscious. It's just not in our consciousness. So from that perspective, what I understand, what I see is that self-realization is nothing more than the process of making the unconscious conscious. And so I feel like if you've you know, done a whole lot of yoga and you've done a lot of practice and you start to really notice the unconscious programs that are running and the unconscious feelings, that eventually in that case, like, Maybe I'm not at 15% conscious and 85% unconscious now. Maybe because of my practice, I'm actually conscious of 40% of the contents of my you know, mind and memories and everything. Um, and so my sense is that self-realization is nothing more than the journey of making the unconscious conscious. And possibly, possibly, it's just a theory I have, being fully self-realized is when there is nothing within the mind or body that is unconscious. So any thought, any feeling, any, any patterning, anything is actually perceived the moment it begins to run or begins to surface. And so you have the thought, but you also have the awareness of where that thought is coming from. Yeah, yeah. Because often we have so many thoughts that we're not actually aware of or we don't question. And the process, for me, the process of self-realization has been mostly around self-inquiry. So it's like noticing a thought and then going, where does that come from? Where does that come from? Where does that come from? How does that feel in the body? Where's that coming from in the body? Does it actually originate in the body? Is it coming from my nervous system? And it feels like a natural progression for me from sort of the neocortex through the limbic system and then down into the reptilian brain. And when you look at trauma, for example, when we experience trauma, it's happening, it's getting stored by the reptilian brain and then it goes up into the limbic and there's emotional, et cetera, responses and then there's the neocortex thoughts, et cetera, around it. So it's like going backwards, un, it's an undoing process of that traumatization of the mind-body. that occurs. It's like an unraveling it back to the source. Totally. Process. That's it. Yeah. And as, what I've discovered is when I start to unravel things and go back to source, I usually, there'll be the thoughts, there'll be the behavior patterns, and then eventually I'll hit some kind of emotional pot of gold where there'll be a massive emotional release that's often accompanied by some kind of nervous system somatic release and, and so what what would the somatic release kind of feel like in your body sometimes it just depends like i mean there's a fight flight or freeze um, response mm -hmm. that we have when we encounter something and what i've found is that when those responses get frozen in the body when i'm going back and having you know releasing something old i might find myself for example curling into a ball like and, and kind of wanting to completely hide away so I'm re-experiencing the um the freeze response that might have originally wanted to be expressed mm -hmm. when that original traumatizing incident happened you know maybe it was I was being bullied at school and I wanted to to freeze and hide away but I couldn't you know and so that response gets frozen in the body because it wasn't able to be fully expressed yeah so what I've discovered is like I've learned through my practice that when my body wants to go into a weird shape or do something really strange is that I just allow it to do it. And then when I'm allowing it to fully express this, whatever weird shape it might be, sometimes it's shaking, sometimes my you know, limbs do odd things. There's often some kind of like the, the nervous system release will happen. And then there's a wave of emotional release that might come through. And then there might be some kind of insight or understanding that comes through. Not always, but you know, that's kind of how it rolls. And for me, that's, that's kind of a self-realization process, you know, like there's a nervous system 
thing. There's a, you know, there's an emotional thing and then there's like a, a knowingness thing. And is this something that arises spontaneously in your own practice? Like say you're just flowing through an asana sequence or more something you get to in a more kind of focused self-inquiry practice? I guess something that you go looking for when you feel like there is one of those threads to be unraveled appearing. It's a bit of both sometimes. Uh, when I first began practicing yoga, like 95 was the first class, but I didn't really, it took me a while to get back. It wasn't until like 99 or so that I started consistently going to classes and I started having massive emotional releases in class all the time. Like I would, I was doing a lot of Bikram and I'd get to like dancers pose in the sequence and I'd just start bawling and I'd cry and I would cry for the entire rest of the class. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was massive emotional releases that were happening through the asana. Is this also a time when there was a lot of physical release happening, like when you're really kind of working into your back issues? Yeah, I think that was it, was that because historically I had emotionally shut myself down. And so any time as a child and teenager there'd been an emotional response, I'd frozen it in my body. So because the yoga was getting me right back into my body, suddenly it was it was kind of like unlocking all of that frozen emotion and it was just pouring through me. So there was those layers that came through. And then now I don't have so so much of that. It's like I've kind of cleared out the backlog of unexpressed emotion from childhood, teenage years, et cetera. And I don't actually, like my practice isn't so much asana based anymore. You know, I still do some for my body. (laughs) It's Mm -hmm. It's kind of come full circle. It's like I do asana because my body needs it. But I'm mostly doing meditation, pranayama, um, and I, a lot of seated postures that are very subtle, very subtle. And I, I kind of read in your book that um, a lot of people like need to start with the body because we are so disconnected from our bodies that until we kind of settle into that... It's almost like we're not even ready to go to those more subtle layers. Like we've got to kind of lay those foundations first. Yeah. I mean, that's my sense, absolutely, is that most people are disassociated. Like, so they live in their heads. And the practice, the physical practice of yoga, which is like, I'm sure why we've seen a massive explosion of the physical practice, the physical practice leads to embodiment, which is nothing more than actually being aware of your entire body you know, that you're not just in your head, that you have a whole body and being able to, to feel the nuances of that. And then my sense is once you have that capability, then it's time to start to move towards the more subtle practices. I don't, I mean, I don't know, but possibly my sense is we're at that crux right now in the yoga world where many of us are ready to move into the more subtle practices, but possibly it's not happening. I don't, I don't know that. Like I'm not out there in every studio. I'm not out there watching what people are actually doing. All I see is through the media and that could be, you know, quite a biased image. But my sense is people are ready for the more subtle practices, but maybe they're not. So I don't know who's teaching it, you know, like where is that coming from now? Who's leading that, those more subtle things? Yeah, like the current teacher trainings equip us to go into those realms. Yeah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's just not there you know and a lot of yeah it's just not there in those particular trainings and you know if you look at the lineages that were originally coming out of India and the way that they were taught you know there's a such an under lineage well that's gone through a massive scandal in the last few years which I have lots of friends who trained in that lineage and it really rocked them to their core and I'm just trying to you know like obviously Iyengar's passed on and he was I don't know what kind of subtle practices he was teaching Tabi Joyce has passed on. I don't know what kind of subtle, if anything, he was teaching. And then, you know, there are other ashrams around the place and other swamis, et cetera. But I don't know how much we're going to them or how much, yeah, I, I just don't know where do we go for the real deal when it comes to the more subtle yogic practices. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know there's places, that there's got to be places and there's got to be teachers, but because of the number of scandals that have gone on and just their distrust in the guru disciple mm. set up and hierarchy etc that maybe we're not accessing them so in some ways do you think that yoga might have lost its way a little bit i don't think yoga can lose its way yeah, 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 that's a <laughs> but i think it's really so this is a, this is this is one of the things is that anything can become a distraction or an attachment on the path itself and so i suspect that because asana is so damn sexy and enticing and fun and captivating, et cetera, that for some, you know, maybe it's become a distraction. It's become an attachment. And so it becomes 
it actually leads to increasing identification with the body, possibly, and increasing in t- attachment to the body and what it can apparently do. But maybe as we, the yoga people out there now are beginning to age, that'll shift as well. Because obviously as we age, the body changes and what it can do changes. And how does our practice change to reflect the, the needs of the aging body? So maybe there'll be a whole other way that will happen as this current round of yoga teachers begins to hit their 70s, for example. Mm. Well, something else that I was really keen to talk to you about is this experience of a really dramatic self-realization or kundalini awakening or ego death experience because um, a few friends of ours have had experiences like this and one guy in particular didn't have a physical yoga practice, didn't really have anyone to turn to to kind of navigate this really full-on experience that he's just had Mm. and resources are scarce so i was wondering if we could kind of go into that realm a little bit and get some advice from you for uh yeah well i mean again i can share from my personal experience because that's kind of the road that i've traveled i had a kundalini experiences for me started in about 2000 i wasn't aware that's what was going on at the time it was kind of gentle initially and then i had a, a big experience in 2004 that I ended up in the psych ward because it blew my circuits. I was not ready for it. And I wasn't able to, to ground and contextualize what was occurring for me. Yeah. Um, And then after that, when I came out, I was like, what the hell just happened? Because I knew it wasn't just psychosis. I'd been diagnosed bipolar. I wasn't sure if that was relevant or not, you know? Um, And so I began to research and because I just had the sense it was to do with yoga yeah. And when I found out about Kundalini Awakening, I was like, oh my God, that so sounds like what I've been through. And it was a relief to hear the truth. It's like, oh my God, I'm not just crazy. There's actually something else going on. Totally. There's a framework and a philosophy for Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Experience. Yeah. Yeah. And so I read as much as I could, but you're right. There's not a lot of really good, useful, healthy information out there. And then I bumped into a teacher and Swami Shanti Murti, who's sadly just died recently, actually. He was an Auckland um, yoga teacher. He'd been teaching for a long time and he could see. He could see that that's what had occurred for me. So he gave me my first external validation that my internal intuition was correct, which was, you know, a massive relief. And then he also gave me a couple of really simple practices, like just chanting Om Namai Shivaya, real simple, alternate nostril breathing, again, real simple. But these things are extraordinarily powerful in the subtle realms. And so since then, I've just worked with the Kundalini energy in my system and I've written about it as much as I can in order to provide some of those resources. Yeah. What, I, yeah, what I notice is that the two most important things when it comes to self-realization or Kundalini experiences are understanding context and relationship, like the way that you relate to your experience and if possible, having a relationship with someone who is able to hold you in that space, not tell you what to do, not tell you what's going on, but just completely accept and see you and love you and you know, hold the space for you. And if you're able to, to find that context and find that ability to relate to your experience in a particular way, it becomes manageable and it, it totally shifts all the worry and the anxiety and the fear and all of that other layer that gets added to the experience when we don't know what the hell is going on. Yeah, I actually had another really regular yoga student of mine who just came to do gentle yoga every week. And she also had a very harrowing kundalini awakening experience. And like as a teacher, I actually didn't feel like I had the understanding to Mm. like that level of awareness to kind of be the person to guide her through it and to help her contextualize and kind of integrate the experience. And so Like, luckily, I knew of a psychologist who was also a yoga teacher who I knew would be a really understanding, non-judgmental kind of referral for her because she was afraid to even talk to a counsellor because she was afraid of being judged. I think she was probably afraid that they'd think she was going crazy. And without that kind of yoga framework, like, you would just think you were losing your mind. And I guess you are losing your mind. Well, yeah, in a way, that, that's exactly what's going on, you know, like uh, the mind itself, the, the separate end, you know, you, you're beginning to disidentify with the mind. That was my experience. It was like, oh, I'm not my mind because here I am observing my mind. It's doing all of this stuff and it, it's actually really not got anything to do with the core of who I truly am. Um, so there's a massive shift of identification and 
and my experience too, like I experienced total one, you know, oneness and it just the, the way that the consciousness is completely altered. And you, I started to realize like how much of our experience is determined by perspective, by context, by relationship, by where we identify with and yeah, how we're relating to what's happening internally. Like it was, yeah, it was, it just yeah. blows, it blows apart every reference you've had internally and externally for what reality is. And it can be spontaneous as well. Like it's, it's something that people, I guess, work towards in their practice if it's a, a part of their practice and a part of their lineage, but it's something that can people just be hit by as well, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that being just being hit by it, it seems, I don't know if it's happening more and more. It seems to be, or maybe we just know about it more. Like, I mean, I have so many people contact me weekly who have had all kinds of experiences because they've read my articles, you know, and it's like, yeah, a lot of them have got no yoga experience or background at all. Yeah. And these things are just occurring, you know, and it's, it's pretty full on when you don't have that context. And ideally, like I, I have this vision that in 10, 20, 30 years time, the mainstream understanding of consciousness, mental health, the body and all of that will have shifted and will encompass the understanding that yoga has of how this all functions and have an understanding of evolution of consciousness which is what it feels to me is happening. There's this evolution, like Kundalini itself is simply the evolutionary process. Have you got any advice to people who might be listening who've maybe had an experience like this and don't necessarily have a trusted someone they can turn to? Sounds like lots of them are getting in touch with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they have. I mean, the, the one thing that worked for, and this is the thing too, like I can only, if I'm working with someone specifically, I'm able to feel and suggest what they might need because it's very it's contextual so it's not like there's a blanket subscription or prescription if this has happened do that yeah, just do that you should you'll be fine <laughs> yeah you know it does and yet at the same time just in general if it's happened what you want to do is work on grounding yourself um, grounding practices and that can be as simple as gardening you know mm-hmm. gardening every day walking in nature and really getting into the body, less meditation, like n- n- not things that take you out of the body or up in a way into transcendence. No, no transcendent practices, no meditation, no two hours of kriyas a day, you know, like just mm-hmm. really, really simple. Um, focus on grounding and focusing on developing the ability to witness yourself internally. So it's really developing the ability to stay completely centered in the I am rather than centered in the mind or in the body. But, you know, for most people who've never done yoga, they're even like, what is she talking about? Centered mm-hmm. in the I am. Yeah. What, what the hell is the I am? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that there's a point or maybe some signs that people should, I guess, be aware of to know that, okay, there's actually time for me to go and see a mental health professional about this? Or do you think that's helpful for people? I think covering all bases is always helpful in terms of kundalini can present as many things and sometimes it's difficult to know like is this a genuine physical or mental or emotional issue that needs addressing within the western framework and or is it a kundalini experience or is it both yeah when i was in the psych ward i kept quiet about the fact i'd had this kundalini experience because i knew that my sense was they'd probably think i was even crazier than they were yeah yeah i think that's a lot of people's sense yeah yeah so I listened, you know, they, they diagnosed me bipolar, they gave me medication, et cetera. And I just rolled with it because I knew that no matter what had happened, my mind system was unstable and it was likely that I did need medication to stabilize the system. And so I took medication for possibly about six months. And then I was very, very careful and very cautious when I began to slowly wean off, making sure that my family, my flatmates knew exactly what I was doing so that it was it was a really smart way to do it, right? So I think it's super, super important to never discount Western medicine at all either. Yeah, yeah. These things work in tandem. You know, you can be having an amazing um, awakening experience and need serious medical support as well, right? So the trick is trying to find some kind of psychologist or a mental health specialist who understands these aspects as well. And there are more and more psychologists out there 
who do have an understanding of the yogic framework or the Buddhist framework, because the Buddhist framework also has a lot around this as well. So it's finding the right person to work with. And with most people kind of have that on their website, if that's part of their practice as a psychologist, or how would people go about finding the right person? I guess Google, for example. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I know I, I know one woman in the UK who's a psychologist who's had her own Kundalini Awakening and worked through that. So, you know, I suspect if you put in psychologist plus Kundalini Awakening, people will come up. Yeah, yeah people that. have written about it. Yeah. Totally. I mean, another phrase that's quite useful is spiritual emergency. And in the States, oh, yeah. there's some dedicated institutes that work with people. So rather than like a mental institution, they're a spiritual emergency institution. So people who are having a spiritual emergency I will go there in order to receive the correct context and relationship and support that they need as they transition. Because it is a massive transition in one way from a, a very mechanicistic um, sort of 3D version of reality into a whole another <laughs> version of reality. And I could imagine as well, just the aftermath of that, like the support you received, the context that, that experience was given could completely shape the way that you would move on from that and whether it's seen as something that's like a massive trauma or like a, an awakening, like it's just that context to be so important. Yeah. It's, it's a lot to do with your own patterns and the way that you perceive things yourself. Um, like if, if you're coming from, you know, really super Christian background, the way that you perceive it is going to be completely different than if you're coming from say a Buddhist background, for example, you know, you've got massive fear and then, this is, this is why traditionally Kundalini Awakening um, was something that was never sought after until you had really prepared your mind and body for the experience. And when I say prepared, I mean you've done the self-realization work to clear out all of the unconscious patterns, to clear out the, literally the fluctuations of the mind so that there's a real steadiness before Kundalini starts to move. Because whatever's still in the system will filter and shape the experience of Kundalini. And if you've still got a lot of shit going on, if you've had real bad trauma, you know, I had a lot, I had a lot of shit that was happening internally, that is going to inform the experience and can make it, you know, a hell of a lot worse. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So if it's happened, if Kundalini has started to move, you know, in an ideal world, you're working with a highly experienced yoga teacher who understands Kundalini and you're working with like a really good psychologist who also understands it and you've got your daily practices and it becomes, in a way, it just becomes how you live your life. It's all about self-realization from that point onwards. And I guess as well, this is, everyone's self-realization experiences are quite different. Like this is a layered kind of thing. So I don't know, I guess I don't want to scare people going to a yoga class kind of. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, in a way, it's got nothing to do with yoga. Like most of the people that I know that have had Kundalini experiences, it has not happened at yoga. It's had nothing to That's do with That's true for me as well. Yes. Yoga. <laughs> That's the irony of it, right? Yeah, yeah. I wonder, if, do you know many people who are in the Kundalini yoga lineage? Um, I do know a few, not, not a massive amount. Um, and this is the interesting thing, right? There's loads of people out there who want to awaken Kundalini. You know, yes, like, yes, like it's a goal of that practice. <laughs> totally, they're, they're working so super hard to do it, you know? And, but it's one of the Kundalini, she just moves when she's ready to move. It's like, I don't think there's anything you can do really to induce her moving or to stop her from moving. I wonder if it's one of those things as well, like the more you're grasping for something, the more you end up pushing it away because you're yeah. kind of chasing it. <laughs> yeah, t totally. Well, this is a slightly different direction, but I've been loving your Yoga Lunchbox articles lately on the dichotomy between contentment and ambition. And I'd love to explore mm -hmm. this idea as I think many yoga teachers and humans in general can relate. Mm -hmm. Notice that manifesting in your life at the moment. Yeah, it's been a really interesting journey for me because I naturally have been a really ambitious person. Um, and so what's happened in like the last 10 years is, you know, that ambition, that desire to create and to achieve and to be um, has been super strong. And, you know, I mean, I, when I wrote 40 Days of Yoga, like I literally started that process in October I think it was 2013 and I had a I was holding a published book in my hand by March 2014. Wow. <laughs> like, and you did a lot, of, a lot of yoga practice in that time as well no doubt. <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely but the interesting thing is with ambition and contentment ambition itself to me feels like it's usually fueled by some sense of, of lack 
which is quite different from when a creative project just happens through you. Yeah. It's like yeah. dharma or destiny or you're called to it and it just flows and it happens. Whereas ambition, it feels as if there's like, I, I need validation or I need love or I'm fearful for security. Like there's some kind of base pattern, unconscious pattern that is creating the ambition that is creating the actions that is creating whatever it is that's being created. And the interesting thing that I've noticed is that the energy that we bring to something, the energy that creates something will largely define it. Ah, yes. That makes so much sense. It's yeah. Like that sense of like, I've got to make this happen and churn this out as opposed to like, as opposed to like, oh, I'm just going to let this flow through me and unfold. Yeah, absolutely. It's a completely different energy. And then there's also some kind of attachment to a result because unconsciously or maybe consciously, the action is being taken, the, the ambition is arising from trying to get something, right? So if all of that happens and the thing is not got, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, then there's massive disappointment or there's all kinds of emotional fallout. Especially when it's a project as massive as writing a book where it's yeah. not just about you writing it, it's about people wanting to read it and buy it as well. Yeah, totally. So ambition fit to me feels like it's really, it's tied up in unconscious drivers, tied up in attachment and attainment and, you know, all of those sticky things. Whereas contentment, it's like a, it's a real ease and it doesn't mean that nothing happens. It doesn't mean that things don't get created. It doesn't mean that there's no action happening, but the action that's happening is coming from a completely different energetic space. And because it's coming from a completely different energy space, there's none of that stickiness. There's none of that grasping. There's none of that attachment. It feels completely different. Is this kind of the feeling now that you're writing your current book from? Oh, good question. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely observing it. Because this, this current book, I mean, God, it started as a book on relationship and then it morphed, kind of set that aside and, and realized that I had to write a memoir of my Kundalini awakening experience. And so my, I started last February, but I, and I've got a first draft done, but like it's, it's almost been a year and all I have so far is a first draft. Yeah. Like the process itself seems to have its own pace and I'm watching this going, am I not being motivated enough? Am I like avoiding like what's going on? Cause I haven't, you know, and I'm like, no, okay. It feels like it's all in order and that. Yeah. Okay. No, it's sweet. I can sense when the next draft is ready to come through and I just have to trust that and show up and do it. So yeah, there's a very different energy behind it because I would much rather sit down and just nail it and dial it out and get it done in six months. Yeah, like your other books. Yeah. <laughs> totally. But that's not what's that's not what's happening. <laughs> so I'm trusting it. I'm trusting it because, you know, since I finished the first draft end of October, so much of my life has shifted and changed. And I can already see now because that draft felt like it didn't have a very complete third act. Mm -hmm. it felt like the themes that were coming up and being expressed hadn't reached any kind of completion. And now in the last sort of four or five months, that, you know, since the end of October, three months, I can sense how the way my life has shifted has given me a broader perspective and a deeper understanding to bring into the second draft. So it is a very different energetic experience in, in writing this book. And there's more trepidation around it because um, I guess I'm writing more in depth about my own life for the first time. I mean, not that I haven't written about my own life, but still. <laughs> <laughs> Like even, I haven't obviously read your latest book, but looking over the kind of continuum of what you've written, it's so interesting because the first one is about the daily practice and mm. like a workbook. And then the second one is about the resistance that might come up within yourself kind of doing that daily practice. And it seems like the third one is the subtler layers beneath that daily practice that you're now exploring into and sharing. Yeah, I mean, my sense was this third one because I want to. I want to write something that, because so many people are experiencing Kundalini awakenings, and because it feels like the mainstream hasn't yet caught up to this particular perspective on what potentially looks like mental health issues, but may or may not be. So I wanted to write something that shares another way of looking at these experiences that so many people are having. I want to spark a discussion around. I'd like it to become really mainstream and. You know, part of me is like, oh God, people are really going to think I'm crazy now. <laughs> you know, I haven't shared a lot of the finer details of, of what I do experience on a daily level. 
because even to me, it seemed kind of crazy. And I kind of feel like internally, I've only come out of the closet to myself in like the last six months or a year and kind of shared a few things with a couple of close friends and say, well, this is actually my experience when I do practice. And am I crazy? And um, it's been quite useful to to have their feedback and to feel what they, you know, I've actually recorded myself practicing and shown it to them to go, what do you think is going on here? Because my practice is largely spontaneous. I will just sit and it, it feels like when I sit, it's like I just tune into the energy of Kundalini, you know, Shakti Kundalini energy. And it just begins to, to move me in this process that feels like the dissolving of the ego, the dissolving of psychological blocks. And I just allow it to unfold. And it's not something that in the yoga world is actually talked about that much. No, because I've looked, like I've actually been looking for a book like yours that I can give people who have had this experience to let them know that they're not alone. Like this is a thing, this happens. Yeah. Here's how someone's moved through it and how she lives now. Yeah, and that's exactly why I want to write it. So someone who can pick it up and go, oh shit, you know, like she fully ended up in the psych ward and this is what she did to recover and this is how she sees it now and this is how she experiences life now. Maybe I'm not so crazy after all. Absolutely, yes, because there's a lot of theoretical, I guess, academic writing about it, like Georg Fierstein's writing, and then there's other kind of more, I guess, psychedelic websites that describe this, but there's nothing on the day-to-day lived experience of what do you do when this happens to you. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can only share my experience too, and the, and the thing is, if you had 10 people who had awakened Kundalini, they'd all have, I imagine, 10 very different daily life experiences to a degree. But it is, it's just expanding out the, the lexicon of what it means to be a human being in a way, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I know that you run a lot of retreats. Mm-hmm. Is this territory that you go into on your retreats or how do you, oh, would you like to describe what you do in your retreats? Yeah. Uh, I don't go into Kundalini awakening stuff. No, no. <laughs> you know, like I don't, I don't, I've had a few people show up who have got awakened Kundalini. I've had a couple of people have experiences on retreat so the way that I run retreat is for me it's about creating a container or a space whereby people are able to drop down into the deepest part of who they are and to witness and be held and be seen for all of the other parts of themselves all of their fears all of their masks all of their patterns all of their identities so that they can to fully welcome, embrace, and integrate those aspects of self. Yeah, beautiful. And so what would a day look like, like a morning meditation? Yeah, yeah. so we do. We start with a morning meditation, usually an open-eyed meditation. You know, if we're in a forest, we'll use a forest. So somewhere we can look at nature, ideally. And then after breakfast, we do the morning session, which begins with a fairly short check-in where everyone just shares, you know, how they're feeling physically in their body so that I get a sense of, of what's needed in the, in the yoga practice. And then out of that sharing, I'll usually speak to it, you know, like things come up and I, I very much teach from what's present in the room in that moment and what's needed. So I don't have a set idea of what I'm going to say at all. I just flow with what's occurring. And then after that check-in, we'll do like a, a good solid practice, which will include, you know, physical postures and breath work and meditation and a really nice long shavasana chanting as well. And that t- takes us up to lunchtime and then there's, there's lunch and there's always time to like swim at the pool or chill out or go for a walk. And then the afternoon session, we sit and we share what's present for us right now. And this is very much about getting people, again, to strengthen their ability to witness themselves. So when you're asked, like, what are you feeling right now, physically, emotionally, energetically and mentally, you know, and then... How does it feel to just be honest about how you're feeling in a group of people who are supporting you? And out of that sharing, there's often a lot of healing that will come. Sometimes I'll work directly with someone using a guided inquiry process. I use energy work as well. But one of the major ways that there's a healing or an understanding that happens is that everyone begins to realize that how similar we all are and how we all share the same challenges, and how we all have the same dreams, and how I'm not alone, and it's not just me, and everyone else has this stuff going on too. And that afternoon session is broken up with, you know, movement work, with breath work, with meditation on a sort of as-needed basis. 
-hmm. So again, it's feeling into where's the energy of the group and what do we need in order to stay grounded, stay present and keep the energy moving. I was wondering if people usually come ready to share or if it's a kind of process of helping them feel kind of comfortable enough to start to open up. Yeah, I mean, people are invited to share as much as they want to or as little as they want to. Like someone could come and not share a whole lot for the whole weekend and that's completely okay. And they would gain so much from simply being in the room, simply being in the room. I mean, by and large, I have about a 60 or 70% retention rate. So what that means is on any retreat, 60 or 70% of the people have been on retreat with me before. And some of them have been on retreat with me three, four, five times. So there's a real deepening of the work. And there's a real sense of the uh, people who have been before of holding and caring for the others. So it's uh, we're creating this tribe of, of people, of elders and new people who are kind of being inducted into this way of, of feeling safe being present with their own experience and being present with other people, you know, which is fundamentally what it means to be a human being, you know, to feel safe, to feel comfortable being who you are and to be seen and validated and loved for who you are. Obviously it's a very energetic process, but is there anything that you consciously do to create that safe space in the room and to kind of hold space in the room? Yeah. There's, I mean, there's a lot that I do. It is kind of hard to break it down or to, let me see if I can. So, because I've held a number of retreats now and that safety, that container is the most important thing. So there are definitely key things that we set up at the beginning that are very clear in terms of, you know, what's shared in the circle stays in the circle and creating a space whereby if anyone's anything's coming up with another person, people can always talk to me individually after each session and they can bring things into the circle as well. So that, because we become this cohesive unit, like we are a system per se, like um, human beings when they get together as a group, become a single entity as a group. And so we really work with that group energy with whatever's occurring within the group. And it is, it's very much about the way I language things and the way that people are encouraged to language things when they're sharing. So when they're sharing, they're owning everything that they say. So not people do you, people do this or you do this or we do this. It's always... I feel this, you know, everything is owned. It's my experience and because we can only ever speak from our experience. And as much as possible, I attempt to do that as well, even as a facilitator, is to be clear that I'm not an expert. I don't know more necessarily than anyone else in the group. It's just that I have lived through and investigated more deeply things that they have yet to live through or investigate and so I'm just there to to hold them in the space so they can do their own investigation so I try not to tell anyone what they're experiencing or tell anyone what to do you know which it's very much about self autonomy and trusting oneself and and respect and boundaries like all of those things are so crucial to create that safety I imagine as well this would be an incredibly rewarding but it would take a lot of your own energy to hold the space and to support all of these people. Are there any self-care practices that you do for yourself, either before or during or after each retreat, just to kind of nurture yourself through this as you're kind of yeah. nurturing everyone else? I always do my own practice first thing in the morning. So I get up early enough so that before the 7am me meditation, I've done my practice. And then I do a prep practice in the morning. Like I have a, a light quick breakfast so that I can get into the room early and I'll do a, yeah what I call a prep practice which is me feeling into the energies of the room and getting a sense for where we might go in the morning session and then the whole time I'm leading retreat I'm very conscious of where my energy is how I'm using my energy and what is needed for me to stay grounded stay centered and stay in the right space in terms of what I'm eating, who I'm talking to, where my focus and attention is, what my relationship is to the earth and to the sky. And it, it's almost automatic now. Like I don't have to think about it per se, unless I start to feel a little bit out of balance. And then it's like, well, what's going on? What do I need right now? But you've done yeah. it enough times that it's part of your own retreat ritual for yourself. Yeah, totally. You know, and what I... In, find that's quite interesting is that generally we don't do things in the evening because it's a pretty full day for people so they have that time to integrate and to socialize and to chill and I find that usually in the evenings I start going through my own processes because I'm holding that space I'm dropping deeper and deeper into presence and as I drop deeper and deeper down in whatever's 
layers of uh, the unconscious I'm getting into, whatever's still there begins to come up. So I often end up processing in the evenings, which means sometimes I don't get a lot of sleep, like maybe four or five hours. <laughs> and then get up early for your morning meditation. <laughs> yeah, totally. But for whatever reason, it's just part of the process. And it's actually, I don't find there's any energetic drain. It feels to me like I'm tapped into something that goes far beyond me and that that energy is what is running the show. And I think it sounds like as well, like just giving yourself that space throughout the retreat. That's why you don't feel drained at the end of it because you've kind of given yourself that your own integration and decompression time, I guess, throughout. Yeah, absolutely. Like every session, as soon as we finish the session, I'm very clear on the way that I close the room down because I work with an altar, I work with sage, I work you know, with energetic practices. I'm using crystals. I, I don't know if they have any impact or not, but possibly they do. So I'm very clear in the way I close down a session and work with the energies. And then the way that I ground and integrate myself after a session, especially if I've done some big healing or energetic work for someone in the circle, we'll often take a break immediately after something like that. And I'll go outside and I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm making it up, but it feels to me like what I'm doing is, is moving the energy through my system and into a tree or a rock or the ground. It's like transmutation is what it feels like. It doesn't matter if it's making it, you're making it up or not. If it's working for you, then it's working yeah. for you. So yeah. you know. totally. I think that's my inner scientist though, because I have quite a scientific way of looking at things. Like I notice what I'm experiencing and I'm like, what well, is that real or is that not real? Is that imagined or is that not imagined? It's like, well, it, like you say, it's working. So I will continue to do it because it appears to be working. You know, I stay grounded. I stay centered. I stay able to hold the space. If I go outside and imagine that I'm, literally channeling energy into a tree it seems to have that impact okay we'll keep doing it maybe yep, it's, yep. <laughs> it's kind of a unique experience to have this really impersonal direct energetic connection to people as a teacher but mm. also through your written work to be teaching people in quite a different way because you don't get to you don't get anything back from them unless they write back to you mm. they, do, you they do too right back oh, nice. <laughs> Do you feel like it's kind of a different part of your brain that you're using in your kind of in-person teachings to your written teachings or is it all from the same source and just a different medium? Uh, it feels like it's from the same source and just a different medium. Yeah. Like when I write, it's, it's, a, it's like a, it feels sometimes like a channeled writing. Like I just tune in and drop in and then open up and allow whatever's there to come through. And I write it down, you know, and I mean, I've, I've written literally millions of words. Like I've, I've had a really consistent like morning practice of, you know, writing words, et cetera. So that process for me is just become completely automatic. And then it's the same when I'm teaching. It's never planned necessarily. I might have a couple of ideas of things I might want to touch on, but it always comes from grounding, centeredness, connection, and then trusting that what comes through is what's needed. And, you know, sometimes I'm sitting there going, I wonder why I'm saying this. This is real interesting. <laughs> and then after the session, someone will come up to me and go, oh, my God, when you said that thing, it just blah, blah, blah. I'm like, uh-huh, that's why I was saying that weird thing, you know? Like, that seems to be how it works. Are there ever days where just nothing happens? Like, there's nothing coming through? <laughs> no. Ah, <laughs> you must be doing something right then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, with writing, because I've, I've had a practice for a long, long time, it doesn't matter what comes through in that practice. I mean, I can just write, I don't feel like writing. I don't feel like writing. I don't feel like writing. Man, I just, you know, it, something always ends up coming through and it might be utter crap or whatever, but it doesn't, I think that's the thing, right? It's going beyond the, the judgment mind, going beyond critical mind is when you fully accept that whatever's coming through is what needs to come through for whatever reason, you know? then we don't, you know, I don't censor myself in my writing like that when I'm doing my personal writing. And that act of personally regurgitating whatever needed to come out seems to have allowed me to clean up myself enough so that when I need to write something specific for a purpose, what comes through is mostly clean. You know, it's mostly for that purpose. But you clear out the chatter. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You know, because later when I read it back, it'll be like, oh, okay, that can come out, that can come out, that can come out, you know. But often, like 40 Days of Yoga, there was very little editing in that book. It mostly, it came out in one two-week flow. It just came out on the page and, it, you know, pretty much like 90% of that made it into the book. Wow, it must have been pretty exhilarating, the process of writing that. 
Yeah, it was. It was like, you know, it kind of felt like a download. Um, I was living in Glenorchy at the time, and which is a small mountain town. And I would uh, go for a walk. I dropped my son at, at childcare and I would walk around the boardwalk, take me about 40 minutes or so. And while I was walking, I was just connecting in and watching my mind and kind of the next chapter would begin to formulate. And then by the time I got home and sat down at my computer, it would just pour out of me and it would be between two and 5,000 words. And that was just the daily process. But the thing is that I had lived the body of work around, you know, showing up to my yoga mat and working with the daily challenges of, of the mind in that. I'd lived it for the last seven or eight years. Like so that was the refining time. So by the time totally. you were it down. Like the hard work had already been done and all it was, was just uh, bringing it all together and, you know, finding a beautiful way to say it and allowing it to, to download, to channel through me. And this is probably an annoying question because you filled two books with this information, but mm. I was just wondering if there's anything that you would like to share with people who are struggling to establish a self-practice Read your books. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, read the books. Definitely 40 Days of Yoga. Like if you read that and you do the worksheets, you will guarantee you'll get on your yoga mat every day. And you'll have a system in place whereby when you don't get on the mat, you know how to work with it. And I think that's the big thing is that when people are struggling to get on the mat and they want to, how they relate to themselves is the first layer. It's the first step. I, you know, are they beating themselves up about it? Are they feeling guilty about it? Are they feeling ashamed? Or are they feeling those things but don't want to feel them so they're pushing them away and are unconscious and just turn away from the practice because to move toward it would mean feeling these uncomfortable feelings. In your writing as well, like you're very adaptable. Like people's practice doesn't have to be an hour. Like you kind of break down these different scenarios of like, oh, maybe if this is your job. Like I think you have the example of someone working on an oil rig who works away for six days maybe their practice could be just a few minutes in their away mm. days but then when they're back home their practice is much more expansive like it's really all about tailoring someone's practice so it fits into their life mm -hmm. setting up this unachievable goal of perfect yogidom where you know you wake up at five to meditate for two hours every day yeah absolutely because you've got to meet people where they are and people have extraordinarily busy lives and you don't want to set people up for failure because it feels amazing. If you get on your mat for seven minutes a day, every single day, this dramatic change that will happen. It just feels extraordinary. And it's almost impossible eventually to only do seven minutes. So you'll find yourself doing 10 minutes, doing 20 minutes, you know, and in essence, the real practice is what happens in the mind in terms of showing up every day. It's the way that the mind will try and stop you from showing up every day. That's the actual yoga. It's not so much what you're doing on the mat, it's how you're relating to the act of getting on the mat. This is, sorry to quote your own words back to you, but I just found yeah. it such a powerful and a beautiful quote. I started my home practice because I desperately needed the small moments of peace that brought me on my mat. I needed my home practice to help me pick up the broken pieces of my psyche and put them back together again. Without yoga, life became a struggle and I could barely keep my head above water. With yoga, I was able to systematically work through the many challenges that came my way. Mm. I just love the, I think sometimes if everything has fallen apart, the, the go-to is, well, how can I possibly fit in a yoga practice because I've got all yeah. of this life stuff to deal with, where actually it's like, oh, these are the moments of peace and clarity that help me deal with the other oh. life stuff. Absolutely. Like if you can just take 10, you know, when your life's falling apart, you can take 10 minutes on the mat a day. It just gives you the fuel and the grounding and the centeredness and everything you need to be able to face what's happening. Mm. I think that could be kind of a beautiful note to Ooh. round things up on. Have you got anything you wanted to ask Ryan? Actually, yeah. this might be a little bit flippant, but one of my favourite articles of yours is uh, the one on coffee. Um, yeah, yes. With a quote by uh, Patabi Joyce, uh, was it, no coffee, no prana? <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering if, if you still have the same views on coffee. <laughs> Ryan really loves coffee. <laughs> oh, I love coffee as well. In fact, recently I've been drinking quite a lot of coffee and feeling immense joy about, you know, half an hour afterwards. And I've been, you know, witnessing this and observing it going, wow, this is really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, the way that I work is, is to deeply understand the impact a substance has on the system. Mm. And then to, to choose, you know, like what's most important for me and what's needed right now. And so... 
generally speaking, I never drink coffee before. I definitely never drink it before teaching. I don't drink it usually in the week leading up to retreat or on retreat. I usually don't drink it before my home practice. But I, at the moment, I'm in a coffee phase. You know, yeah. I'll be having coffee every day and enjoying the hell out of it. You know, Do coffee and writing go well together. <laughs> Um, no, I find they don't because again, uh, because I tend to work from more channel space and the coffee interferes with the, the steadiness that allows that channel to flow free. And I think there's no right or wrong. That's what it always comes back to for me. It's more along the lines of what experience do you want to have? What's useful? What are you attempting to experience? And the jitteriness or the, yeah, where coffee takes me with reference to prana and the flow of prana yeah, it's not so great. Where it takes me in terms of joy, and, <laughs> you know, like it can sometimes be really, really useful, especially if I haven't had a lot of sleep for whatever reason. Drinking a coffee can be exactly what is required. Does that help at all? <laughs> we all need a treat sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but it's also, it's observing your relationship to it like anything. It's like, am I attached? Am I addicted? What would happen if I wasn't to drink any coffee for a week? How does that make me feel? What does my mind say? You know, because the, the real question is, it's always for me about mastery. Am mm. I fully at choice here? Mm. You know, am I able to do what is needed? Or is there some kind of addictive desire attachment thing that's getting in there? Um, and I'm about to do a cleanse, actually, for about a month. And so I'm just feeling into, right, if I'm going to do that, I'll probably decide that I won't drink any coffee. And so then I'll get to observe what it's like to have none in my system for a period of time. And it actually, for me, feels really amazing. So it's always this toss-up between the amazingness of a really clean consciousness and the amazingness of the coffee experience. Mm. Right? So it's like, okay, let's go coffee-free for six months. Okay, let's have loads of coffee for six months. <laughs> Either or, whatever's required. I think it's an interesting question as well. I was like, oh, how would I feel if I stopped having this? And like often your response to that question is kind of a good answer as to um, your relationship yeah. to that habit. <laughs> exactly. And, and the, the stronger the attachment, like for me, if I feel that strong attachment, then it's more of an indication that, right, then I need to do this in order to to really be master of my destiny, master of my choices, master of my system. It's like a little like wake up alarm bell I guess yeah exactly exactly you know the same with alcohol like I go through stages where I really enjoy having a few drinks and then I go through stages where I don't touch it at all you know so in a way it feels like the best of both worlds excellent well I guess uh, that probably brings us on to our picks of the week I'll start with my pick of the week which is uh, the music of Sign Pearl who is a great ambient music producer I think he's from Sweden I might have to double check that but it's great ambient music and I actually use it a lot in my own meditations and occasionally when I'm guiding meditations. He has a particularly beautiful song called In the Garden, which really evokes the, the feeling of being in an English garden on a warm spring morning. Or a Swedish garden. <laughs> yeah, or a Swedish garden, yes. Universal garden. <laughs> Location independent. So, yeah, that's my pick of the week and I'll put a link to his music in the show notes. Yeah, it's beautiful music to practice too. Mm. So my pick is quite technology focused. It's a YouTube channel by Peter McKinnon and he's a photographer and cinematographer and it's all about how to take more beautiful photographs but it's super accessible and he's quite focused as well on how you can get the results that you want without necessarily investing in a whole lot of super expensive equipment, how you can kind of rig things up, how you can use natural light just better ways to use Photoshop or Premiere. And he does even like two minute Tuesdays, which is two minutes on some aspect of photography. So because he is a photographer, his work is beautifully shot and edited. So it's quite fun eye candy. And much as we might not love it, it is kind of the reality of many yoga teachers that you do have to have a digital presence. And it can be a bit daunting. So here's a really good way in just to how to take better photographs and better videos of what you do. And I guess there's just that joy in seeing someone who's super passionate and super excited about what they do that makes you inspired to try new things. And he's also a stage magician. So. Oh, he's a stage magician as well. So he's got that performer aspect. Yeah. So my pick of the week is a book that I have just finished reading called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. And interestingly enough, the subtitle is How to Lose Your Mind and Create a New One. 
Oh. <laughs> yeah, and it kind of feels like the process that I've been through over the last 13 years or so. It's by Dr. Joe Dispenza, who's the best-selling author of Evolve Your Brain. And the book is quite scientifically focused. I think he's a neuroscientist. He studied biochemistry with an emphasis in neuroscience and has a doctor of chiropractic from a university in Atlanta. So it's all about neurology, neuroscience, brain function, chemistry, cellular biology, memory formation. And I have loved reading it because it feels to me like it provides a scientific understanding of what I've experienced through the yoga framework. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds fascinating. Mm. Yeah, it is. And it talks a lot about um, brainwaves and the different brainwave states like delta, alpha, beta. Beta is the one that we're in mostly um, day to day. And when I was reading through that brainwave state, it really helped me to understand the process that we go through when we're on retreat. So yeah, like just the way that when we shift the way, the, the state of brainwaves, how it shifts our ability to be able to access the unconscious. And I'm wow. like, oh, so that's what happens when we do our yoga practice and our meditation, et cetera. It's shifting the brainwaves, which is giving us access to things, which is why things start to go, oh, okay, yeah, got it. So I'm, yeah, I'm stoked on this book and I think it's going to become one of those reference books on my library shelf, whereby for those who are a little bit more, they need the scientific understanding of something. Yeah, definitely. So it's like, oh, okay, this is what's happening on a scientific level. And this is how it's framed in the yogic world, you know, and those two things start to map more and more and more. So that's my pick of the week. Like if you're interested in directly working with your mind through yoga, et cetera, and you want to understand more of what's happening from the scientific perspective, breaking the habit of being yourself. Oh, great pick. I really want to read that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time and for sharing with us today. It was really great to talk to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, my pleasure. Such a delight to come on and and be interviewed. So thanks for listening. As I mentioned at the start, we were super excited to talk to Cara Lear, and I think you'll agree she shared some great information. Next episode, we have another exciting guest, yoga teacher and host of the podcast Anatomy of Living, Ashton Zabo. We discuss a whole range of exciting topics, including his life and travels, And also, we go and see the expectations around health and lifestyle that are placed upon yoga teachers. Ashton is an amazing storyteller, and I just love how he explains mythology and its deeper symbolism. So it was really interesting to hear about how he integrates yogic philosophy into his daily life. Just before we leave you, I'd like to ask that you please subscribe or rate us on iTunes, Podbean, Podcast Addict, Stitch, or wherever you download your podcast. It will really help us get the word out there so we can share this podcast with the world. Finally, we would really love to hear from you. You can drop a note on our website at podcast.flowartist.com or look for us on Facebook or Twitter. The theme song, as always in this podcast, is Baby Robots by Ghost Soul and used with permission. Do yourself a favor and get us music from ghostsoul.bandcamp.com. Thanks again. Big, big love. <laughs>